Hello, everyone. Thank you to everyone who has joined us. Um, we're thrilled to open our international symposium on lay use and perceptions of machine translation, virtually hosted by the Department of Translation and Interpreting Studies at Bar Ilan University and supported by a grant for interdisciplinary research from the Bar Ilan University Rector. We have before us six fascinating presentations and one round table with speakers gathered literally from all around the globe. So this symposium uh, responds to a dramatic shift in the landscape of translation in recent years brought about by the rise of machine translation. This shift, which has been immense and is still growing, is really about the use and influence of machine translation in everyday situations around the world. And because many in our audience and most of our speakers come from translation studies, uh, this might be the place to state the obvious. Machine translation does not specifically serve professional translators. Freely available uh, machine translation systems are accessible online for all in developed and developing countries alike. With close to 150 billion words being processed just by Google Translate alone every day, and 30 trillion sentences translated annually in over 100 languages, it is clear that this tool's social implications are not limited to the translation community, but have an increasing effect on multilingual communication and understanding in a globalized world. Globalized world. So in other words, translation phenomena in our time, in the broadest sense of the word, are increasingly defined by how lay users people with no professional translation experience use and perceive machine translation. Nonetheless, most studies so far and conferences and conference sessions on machine translation uh, coming from a humanities or social sciences approach have focused on professional translators perspectives and practice with machine translation, uh, have touched on implications of machine translation for the translation profession. This is a valuable body of research that includes a lot of important studies and excellent contributions. Uh, still, we must remember that only a small proportion of translations is done today by professional translators worldwide. It was recently suggested, I think by Anthony Pym, that 99% of the translations produced globally, 99% are not done by professional translators, professional human translators. And this clearly has much to do with machine translation. Now, even if 99% might not be the exact proportion, it is clear that translation phenomena, again, in the broadest sense, are increasingly defined by how lay users perceive and use machine translation. So all this is to say that we believe our speakers today, who represent some of the emerging voices on this topic, are doing work that is truly timely. And this symposium, which has brought these speakers together, is, as far as we know, the first conference to be devoted particularly and exclusively to this important and growing, uh, quickly growing phenomenon. As uh, has been mentioned before me, uh, we are lucky to have speakers from all around the globe, from Canada, Japan, Israel, United States, Finland, and England. So between us, we are covering about 17,000 kilometers and also a variety of languages. Uh, we here are pretty much couched in the middle, some 8,500 kilometers from Ottawa to one side and about the same distance to Kyoto on the other. And this global spread seems to me particularly fitting for our symposium's topic. Um, so before we begin, let me say a few words about technicalities. So we have before us a one hour session then a 15 minute break, then another one hour session, and then our speakers round table discussion. In each session, we have three 15 minute presentations. We will hear them consecutively, one after the other, and we'll save the Q&A and discussion to right after all the three presentations are completed. So please write any questions you would like to ask our speakers through the chat. Um, you can post your questions in the chat and this can be done at any point during the presentations. Uh, just please remember to state the name of the speaker to whom the question is addressed and also if possible, your name and affiliation. So uh, without further ado, 
Um, it's a pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Lucas Nunes Vieira. Dr. Vieira is a senior lecturer in translation studies at the University of Bristol in the UK. He researches cognitive and sociological aspects of using machine translation in human translation processes and in communication. He has a PhD on post-editing of machine translation from Newcastle University in the UK, and his PI is principal investigator of Improving Products and Processes in Translation Technology Use, a project funded by the UK's Economic and Social Research Council. The title of Dr. Vieira's talk is Lay Uses of Machine Translation in the UK, a representative survey. Hi everyone, uh, thanks a lot for the introduction and the invitation. Let me just share my screen with you. Um, Okay. Um, right, so um, I'll be talking about some of my recent work on lay uses of machine translation and different implications of uh, using machine translation in different contexts. Um, this will be mainly um, based on our UK uh, context, and that's because of a survey that we conducted um, recently at the University of Bristol, so I'll give more details um, in a bit. But just to explain some of the context and where sort of the, this survey um, comes from, um, for a little while now, I've been interested in sort of the public discussion of, of machine translation and, and the, the different ways in which kind of, in which machine translation is perceived in the public sphere. And one um, study that, that I carried out on this topic was to do with news um, articles and the ways in which machine translation is described in the news. And these, this is just, um, a couple of examples of things that I came across. Um, so this um, headline here at the, at the top, so Google Translate now as good as a human. This came out in 2016, which was a good two years before um, the claim of human parity became sort of reached the mainstream with um, um, a study that was published in 2018 by, by Microsoft. So, and there was a similar claim that had been made by Google at the time, but the way that that hit the news in, back in 2016, I think was quite um, striking. And um, I, I'm not sure that we paid the, the, the right amount of attention to the ways in which machine translation was being discussed in the news um, at the time. And I think that this matters because this has consequences for how we communicate and for how different constituencies might use the technology um, on a daily basis. Um, uh, also, as part of my uh, work on, on this topic, um, I've also been interested in high stakes machine translation. Um, so different contexts in which users uh, resort to machine translation in situations that could have serious risks if there's a translation error or um, if the technology is misused um, somehow. So um, last year, we published, I published a study together with Minako Hagen and Carol Sullivan on this, so we, we scoured dif different databases and different types of policy documents and government documents to come across different examples in which machine translation was being used in what we considered to be high stakes um, contexts, mainly involving potential legal or medical uh, consequences uh, to, to machine translation use. And some of the examples we came across were quite striking. Um, so uh, there were, um, MTUs by applicants filling out immigration forms, for example, with serious consequences for, for the applicants, as well as by immigration officers themselves. And, and some of the documents that we came across actually made for quite difficult reading. Um, so this particular example of a, a, an, immig an immigration officer using Google Translate, um, that was um, a situation in which um, the officer simply typed uh, sentences into Google Translate and then try to read the sentences out loud to a child uh, who was already in a vulnerable um, um, situation and the, the officer didn't speak any Spanish. This was from, um, so the questions were in a form in English and they were translated into Spanish and then the officer in that situation tried to read the sentences, read the translations out loud even though the, the, the immigration officer didn't speak any Spanish and didn't, couldn't pronounce the, the words properly. So I don't think that machine translation is what caused that situation, but I would argue that machine translation in that instance uh, exacerbates 
a, a situation of that is already uh, uh, precarious for, for that individual who is in a vulnerable position um, as it stands. So I think that we should be paying attention to the ways in which the technology can exacerbate these types of contexts. I mean, these types of um, use contexts and, and what that means uh, for our field and for the study of machine translation. So this survey that I'll be talking about is kind of the next step in, in, in these uh, series of studies. And we wanted to gather further evidence of how machine translation was being used um, sort of on the ground by, by, by people on a daily basis. Um, and we, we were interested in details of uses and, and, and perceptions, but also how um, respondents conceptualize translation and, and machine translation, uh, their approaches to risk or what they understood to be, uh, or what they understood by risk, as well as the national context in the UK, which was a feature um, of our survey that I'll explain in a bit. This is not the first survey on this topic, but there are a few studies uh, on this. I mentioned two examples here, um, one by Mary Nomigan, who will be presenting later. Um, and also um, a survey uh, by Gaspari that came a bit before that. Um, I, I think ours that try, we tried with, with this survey to get into a bit more detail about conceptualizations of risk, as well as to, uh, to allow respondents to, to talk freely about the topic in, in two bits of the survey that I'm going to talk about in a bit. Um, so I won't go into um, a lot of detail about uh, our methodology, but I can come back to, to this slide um, later. So um, the first, the, the important things to mention is that um, this, uh, I, had, I had a few colleagues involved in this process. Uh, so Carlos Sullivan and Xiao Chen Zhang uh, here at Bristol and also Minako Hagen at the University of Auckland. And the important bits of uh, the methodology are that we use the prolific um, data collection platform. So this is um, a data collection platform that has lots of users that register with them to take part in, in, in this type of research. And we use the representative feature of, of that data collection uh, facility or the, the data collection service, if you like. Um, and what that means is that we, uh, we try to ensure that our sample was representative of the UK population, the UK adult population, in terms of age, sex, and ethnicity. So they, they will then stratify the, the data collection just so there will be separate targets for, uh, that, that ensure that the sample mirrors um, the UK population according to these three traits. Um, based on census data uh, for the UK in, in 2019. I can come back to these details later, um, but I'll, for now I'll just um, move on. So these are just um, some uh, details of our respondents. Um, they, most of them had a university degree. Um, most of them were in full-time education and about 11% um, of them were students um, at the time. Uh, I, I don't kind of report uh, the details about the representative uh, aspect of the sample here because that, that basically mirrored the UK population in, in, in 2019 in terms of age, uh, ethnicity, um, and, and so on. But these were some of the details that are not part of the representative aspect um, of the sample, so it's important to kind of um, to mention those. Um, and then we, we get to some of the key questions. And the first question that we had to ask was if um, respondents had used machine translation before. And this may seem like a trivial question, but this was actually one of the most difficult questions that, that you can ask, I think, people, because defining machine translation is difficult. Um, I think people come, in, come into contact with the technology in different ways, and there are different types of technology available online, and it, it's not trivial to define machine translation. So that was our first challenge. Um, there were a number of pilot surveys before we conducted this one. So there was uh, what we called an alpha survey and then a beta survey. And what we decided to do that is, so the, 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 based on those pilot results, um, the term that we went for was automatic translators, which is what we thought was the most transparent term based on those initial results. And we also defined uh, machine translation at the beginning and gave the example of Google Translate, which is how most people would come into contact with the technology, at least in the UK. Um, and we hoped that that would um, solve the problem of defining the technology, but it wasn't completely solved. So um, 911 um, uh, people in our sample, so the sample had 1,200 uh, responses. So that was the largest sample that we could go for with the representative feature. Because uh, if you go for larger samples, that means that certain age brackets would be overrepresented. So that, that is the most that we could um, do. 
So it's about 75% of, of the sample um, had declared using machine translation before. So given our 3% um, margin of error, what this means is that we can say with some confidence that over 70% of the UK population at that point, UK adult population, uh, would have used machine translation already. I think that that's an underestimate because in there were some no answers, people saying that they had not used machine translation. And actually, when we looked at some of the details of what they said later, um, th we came across evidence that they had, in fact, used machine translation. It's just that they missed some aspect of the definition and so on. Um, and just to explain here, if this was one of the first questions in the survey, so if if respondents said no, they just went to a, almost like a separate survey uh, where they talked about situations in which they might have needed to use translation or might, might have needed to translate something or speak to someone um, using a different language. And, and I won't go into those details here, but that was kind of a separate aspect um, of what we did as part of this survey itself. Um, we also asked for specific details of um, the situations where they had used machine translation and a number of um, um, important information that we that came back from um, this question and the ones that followed it. And we were particularly interested in, in what I mentioned at the beginning about high stakes machine translation. Um, so there was one option that they could choose. Um, they said it, they asked if whether they needed, uh, whether they used machine translation in a situation where they needed urgent help or where they were in a situation they considered to be serious. So for example, in a hospital or at a police station. Um, 19 respondents um, said that they had been in that situation before. So that's quite infrequent, um, considering that the sample had 1,200 people. So it's about 1% of respondents had been in that situation before. But I would, I would argue that this is not negligible, given um, this potentially serious implications of using machine translation in context of this nature. So we're, we're going to more detail. Um, in a bit. Um, then we also wanted to know of those who had mentioned using machine translation before what their idea of risk was. Uh, we purposely did not define risk at the beginning before answering this question. We wanted, we wanted that um, to come from them, what they understood uh, risk to be. And um, about 23% of them said that yes, they felt that using machine translation had represented some type of risk. Um, after um, they, ans they answer that question, then we ask for more details about what they uh, understood to be their risk or what they, uh, how they understood uh, uh, that risk and how they rated um, that risk as well. So generally, generally the, the level of risk was considered to be medium to low um, and the types, uh, in, in the types of risk as well, most were to do with the situations in which they had used it before. So personal reputation mainly because of the different uh, communicative situations in which they were um, using machine translation. But then when we look at those who answered that question about using machine translation in hospital or at a police station or in other situations that they considered to be serious, of those 19 respondents, most of them said that, no, they never felt that machine translation posed any risk. So the, the majority of those who had been in that situation did not see any potential risk. And it may be that depending on the, the specific circumstances that, that, they, that you know, pertain to their use, um, it may be that that didn't pose any risk, but just the potential coming from the context, I think, is there. And I think that this is something that we should be paying attention to. Um, and then we get to the part of the survey where we um, ask them to just speak freely in, in, in response to two questions. And, and special thanks here to, to Carol Minako and Sarah Chen, who worked with me quite closely um, on these two questions and on the analysis as well. So uh, the first question was, what would make them uh, prefer machine translation as opposed to uh, a professional translator? And the other question is, how in their words they, they described um, the ideal machine translation system of the future, what, what they thought that the system should do, or what it, you know, the, the types of results that it should provide. And then we analyze these answers according to a set of categories. Um, and then we, we, we try to plot some of the results to see the most frequent aspects in, uh, in, in respondents' answers. Um, so these were, again, they, they provide the answers completely freely. These were open text responses 
So these uh, counts that I provide here are based on our own analysis of these responses. Um, I don't think that the quantitative results are particularly surprising. It's when you look at the detail of what they said um, that we, we, uh, we were struck by some of the, of the things that were mentioned. Uh, but just to, to mention some of the uh, quantitative stuff uh, really quickly. So usability, speed, and cost, the key factors that would make um, users resort to machine translation. So I don't think that this is surprising, right? It's the idea of uh, the convenience of machine translation as, as a very strong factor. I mean, it, it's almost if the, the convenience of using MT makes it irresistible in some situations. And, and I think that this is something that we have to bear in mind for policy, we have to bear in mind in terms of the way that, that, that this convenience might affect um, questions for how it should be used and whether it should be used as well. L Lucas, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry to barge in. We're looking at 15 minutes now, so if you could uh, start. I'll wrap up, yeah, I'll wrap up. So, um, and then answers to the other question were mainly focused on quality, but perceptions of quality were um, in some cases a bit problematic. And these are just a few examples of answers. Um, so the first one, um, I would prefer um, a person to translate it as it's more relatable and less time consuming as systems um, may not translate the, the way I want to say something. So the emotion. So I think one thing to note about this answer here is that not necessarily machine uh, translation systems would be deemed to be faster. So there are situations in which humans can be faster. And then these are the um, open text um, responses here. Struck us based on how uh, they deemed the machine translation system in some cases to be more trustworthy. So the idea of the myth of the of the object of machine objectivity, and of how sometimes humans might purposely introduce errors to the text, um, which was mentioned quite often as well. Um, and then the idea of anonymity and privacy, so along the same lines. So sometimes so we, I was very surprised by this, that there was uh, quite a few, uh, there were quite a few answers that mentioned using machine translation as a way of, you know, it's just between you and Google Translate. You're, you're not sharing this with anyone else, but actually you're typing the information into Google. So, um, uh, and then in relation to quality, just to, to finish now, um, Total certainty. So this in relation to what would make them choose machine translation, right? So total certainty that the translation uh, of what I'm writing will convey exactly the same meaning. So that over expectation, I think, of translation and not necessarily of machine translation. So convenience of MT irresistible. I think we have to bear that in mind. There's no point saying don't use it. Um, it there are situations in which that's not that can't be avoided. Um, I think that the second. Um, humans not necessarily seen as more trustworthy. So the myth of, of machine objectivity and impartiality, we also need to take that into account. And, and third, high states use infrequent, but not negligible. And I think that this is exacerbated by poor machine translation literacy, but I think fundamentally by poor translation literacy. Um, there, there was uh, sometimes a poor understanding, not necessarily of machine translation, which is how people come into contact with translation, but of translation itself and of communication and language. Sorry for going over time. Thank you so much, Lucas, uh, for your highly instructive presentation. It was fascinating. Um, if anyone has questions, uh, please write them in the chat and we will present them to Lucas at the end of the three uh, presentations. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Marie Nurminen is a university instructor and PhD candidate at Tampere University in Finland. She teaches translation, Finnish to English translation, interpreting and uh, writing. Her dissertation focuses on the context in which MT machine translation gisting takes place and the factors in those contexts that influence people's use and reception of raw machine translation. And the title of uh, Mary Norminen's talk is Experienced Machine Translation, Gisters, Perceptions of Machine Translation and Themselves as Machine Translation Users and Teachers. All right, <clears throat> can you see this? Voice is okay and, and sharing is okay? Yep, all right. First, I have to apologize because I have a cold and just today it decided to go into my voice. So I'm just 
hoping that it, it lasts throughout this presentation. Um, I'm here to talk about a quite different kind of user than Lucas was talking about. Um, the information comes from a study I did in 2019, and this was a very experienced users of machine translation. Um, it focused on nine experienced users in Scandinavia. And it was a qualitative study, so that is also very different than Lucas's. I don't have percentages of, of people who said this or that, but this was more an exploratory study to see what's going on, what they're doing, how they're using machine translation. So I will go through the users, the use, and the perceptions, basically three parts, starting with the users. So I, I, in my title is the phrase experienced MT gisters. And what I'm talking about there are patent professionals. These are people who work in the field of intellectual property rights or our IPR. They have titles like patent attorney, which is by the way, not a legal, it is not a lawyer, but that is what they're called. Patent counsels, patent examiners. And they work in different areas of IPR. Some worked for companies that create patents. Others were service providers that help companies who are creating patents. And some were from a governmental office that grants patents. So there were different types of people, but they all worked as patent professionals. I also, in my abstract, use this phrase, perhaps the most experienced group of MT users, which might have surprised some people who easily consider translators to be the most experienced. But I noticed during my study that Perhaps this is not the case. I have two data points to illustrate this. Both are from 2012, and one was from a survey of translators. And in this study, they found that 42% of respondents say, yes, I use machine translation in my work. But in the same year, an article in IPR research had this quote that surely everybody who's working with Chinese, Japanese, and Korean documents is reading them using machine translation. So here again, the lay user, as Omri talked about, is actually perhaps a more frequent and experienced user than even translators. I also had a kind of disclaimer that I'm, I'm not that sure that lay users is a correct title for these people because they're using machine translation in a very professional way in, in their work. But then I thought, but, but they're not translating for their work. So I guess this does fit the bill of lay users after all. So how they use raw machine translation. To take a look, first of all, uh, uh, on the different kinds of needs for translation in IPR work, in patenting work. Uh, people need translation when they're applying for patents. And this is mostly done through human translation. And we don't know that that very often might include MT, but still it's a human process. Uh, Patent professionals use translation when they need information on very important patents. And again, they would rely on human translation for this, which might include MT, we don't know. But then they use raw machine or machine translation when they're reviewing patent documents to identify the most relevant ones. So they're looking for, for relevant information among a huge mass of information. And they're doing that through MT gisting. And this is the one we're talking about in this presentation. I defined MT gisting in my PH work because I didn't feel there was a good enough definition available. So I define it as when a person knowingly consumes raw machine translation with the aim of understanding as much as they need for a specific purpose they have. And I also define this use case as belonging to the category of needle in the haystack, meaning that it, there are situations when people have a huge amount of information and the only way they can get through it to identify the relevant parts is to use machine translation. This does not always mean that the relevant parts go to human translation. If, if the understanding of machine translation is good enough, they may stay in machine translated form and be used as is. But other use cases of this type, academic research, researchers might read other language um, articles using this and e-discovery, which is a legal process. I could also categorize this use as high stakes use uh, to use Lucas's term, um, because legally there are high stakes and actually financially there are high stakes in this use. 
So a quick overview of the use is that the MT gisting it's frequent, professional, it's quite uniform, the way that different patent professionals use MT. It is domain specific. They're using engines that have been developed for patent work. And these have been developed for the past 20 years already. And the most common MT languages are Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. And this is simply because most patent, not most patents, but a high percentage of the patents that are being filed are coming from these languages and English. So this is a bit different than other MT use perhaps in that the languages being used even here in Europe are tend to be uh, these Asian languages. All right, but getting into the nitty gritty of what they're doing. So a patent starts with an idea. Somebody has an idea for an invention. And the very first question they need to ask themselves is, but does this already exist? Because if it does, it's not worth filing, putting in the work to file a patent application. So to do this, to find out if it exists, they need to review a lot of documentation, basically any patent anywhere in the world and patent applications um, that have anything to do with their idea. So they're, and they're responsible for reviewing all of these. Um, something over 30% on average are in languages other than English, and they are as responsible to review those as they are in other languages. And the, the amount can be quite large. One of my informants said, sometimes you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of documents that you have to get through. The purpose of this is to identify a small part of that document set that are the most relevant um, <clears throat> documents. And you're going to use those in your patent application process and write your patent application so that it for sure does not overlap or infringe on any existing patent or patent application. That small set might also be used throughout the patenting process to help defend your ideas and your stance that it does not infringe on others. Now, the biggest risk in this whole thing is to miss a relevant document. Um, the professionals I talked to, my informants, went over this again and again, how the biggest risk is definitely to miss something relevant because you might waste time filing for a patent that's already covered elsewhere, or you might end up in court in a case of infringement. So when during this process, the patent professional is constantly weighing two things, which is, do I send this particular document for human translation or rely on the machine translation? They describe this to me as kind of a risk benefits weighing that was going on pretty much at all times. So on the side of human MT or human translation, things like how risky a process are we in when we're using this information? How severe are the possible consequences? And how relevant is this document to my case? So there, there, these are the things that would say like, yes, you should go for human translation. Please you know, put out the money and, and order human translation. On the side of machine translation, of course, lower costs, but also much quicker access to the document. Human translation takes time. And also weighing in heavily is their trust in how well they think they understand the MT. Now this understanding, it's important to, to point out that it's not just about the MT output. They, they don't have random text being put out by some machine translation engine, but they have other things that help them understand and make sure they understand. And here are just a few examples. Um, they work closely with the technical experts behind the inventions. And between these, these two parties, they have a very good knowledge of the subject matter and the genre of patents. There are other elements than simple text that they rely on. So there are pictures and formulas and other things in patent documents that also help them understand. Sometimes they use multiple MT tools. If they are doubting a passage, they might throw it into a, a separate tool to see if it's any better. And their environment supports this use. It's seen as legitimate and they have guidelines, even official governmental guidelines include machine translation and they have support available. So onto their perceptions. I'm gonna cover their perceptions of machine translation of themselves as users and teachers. The first one is about MT. Now I, we see it as, as a very risky prospect. Um, so far in this, this symposium, we've talked quite a bit about risk. 
But it's important to remember in this case that the risk of missing a relevant document is the higher level risk. It's the more important risk. And actually using machine translation is a way to mitigate that risk. So you take on a new risk to make sure to, to make a, a higher and more severe risk less likely. And that's you know like kind of a different way of looking at this. Another thing about their perception, this is from Back to the Future. And if you remember Doc Brown, he was more than anything, a garage inventor. And I ran into the concept of the garage inventor several times in my interviews. Um, the, the view in the patenting world is that it should be possible for the garage inventor to be on the same level as inventors who, corporate inventors who have lots of money behind them. And because patenting is a very long and expensive process and the translation is part of that, MT is seen as a, a tool for equality. It's a way to make it possible for the garage inventor to compete and the inventions to, to be more of a meritocracy that, that you, they advance based on their merit. Um, I asked in the very first interviews, I asked what people thought of quality. And I soon learned that that is, you aren't gonna get very good information by simply asking that. So I quit asking that. And, and most of this information comes from when they brought up these comments otherwise. Um, I found that they're fairly realistic about the quality issues. They know there are problems, but they say, you know, it's it's a lot better than nothing. Uh, they, they said, you know, the quality is what it is. We don't know if it can get much better. And there was always a very healthy doubt, like in this quote, like, I got this translation, but I started to ask myself, like, can it really be that way? I know this technology. So... I put it into another tool and found out that, oh yes, the translation had an error. But they also saw that the usefulness, the places where it should be used is limited. And that was, they were fairly consistent in saying that it's good for information, but it should not be used in a court of law or for filing patents. A better question I came up with is, was that how often is it successful? Meaning that you get enough information from the translation that you are immediately able to act on it. And then it was a very positive view that 90% or above, very often they said that was enough. Now that often meant that they could see that this has nothing to do with their invention they're working on so they could throw it out and call it not relevant. Um, but nonetheless, they found that it very often was successful. How they saw themselves as MT users, again, the risk comes up. And when I went into this, I didn't really start asking about risk as a main topic. It simply came up through my analysis. And they brought it up often that, that they see their use of MT as a balancing of risk. And, but they also pointed out that their work contains a lot of risks and, and they have to be good at working with risks and evaluating risks at all times. And in just dealing with that kind of work. So they saw themselves as risk managers, but they also brought up uncertainty because working with machine translation, you're never 100% sure. Um, there's always some uncertainty involved. One of them said, I'm, I'm not that be much better at understanding MT, but I'm better at accepting this uncertainty. Another said, you have to be very transparent with clients even that this is what the machine translation says, but it does contain some level of uncertainty. Finally, how they saw themselves as teachers of machine translation. Now, when working with the technical experts, they are often the ones, the patent professionals are often the ones teaching them, first of all, to how they should be reading patent documents, but also then how to get them to accept and understand raw MT. This was often done on a one-on-one -on -one basis with new people. Um, so the, these are some of the more experienced teachers of MT literacy that we have. Uh, a, a comment on learning to teach. Well, I, yeah, it, I had to go to a new level of understanding my use of machine translation so that I could teach it to others. And it takes time talking with colleagues about this use. Many brought up the fact that it's a persuasion thing. You have to persuade people to go ahead and spend the time and energy to read the machine translation and to see meaning in it. It is possible to see meaning in the MT. And this takes time. Finally, it was interesting that empty literacy is often defined as, as other technical literacies that have a lot to do with competences and knowledge. But in this case, 
literacy actually goes back to the original idea of literacy and learning to read. And they told me that, you know, you sit, that you read through it with people. This is how you train them. You ask questions. Are you sure? You get them to say, oh, I see. Yes, you're right. That word is comprises. That's an important word in a patent document. So I see what you mean there. Um, another said, it, it's like with a child, we read aloud. I tell them how it should be read and understood, point out what are important things to pay attention to in this particular case. And after some practice, people use it and get, realize that's useful. In summary, uh, the group of patent professionals is a professional group with a very long and broad experience in gisting. They have found ways to successfully integrate gisting into their processes. They do see it as a balance of risk. Uh, this is not a, a group that you have to lecture on the, the risks of MT use. They know it very, very well. Um, and similar use cases exist or are emerging. And this is important because we have a lot we can learn from these professionals that have been using machine translation for such a long time. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Mary. It was great. Um, and now let us move forward uh, to our uh, final presentation in this session. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Montira Pitakusuvan. Uh, Montira is an associate professor at the College of Information Science and Engineering at Ritsumeiken University in uh, Shiga, Japan. She received her master's and doctoral degree from the graduate school of Informatics Kyoto University, and she's interested in the areas of human computer interaction, computer supported collaborative work, collaborative learning, design thinking, and design method. Her current project focuses on creating an intelligent agent to facilitate intercultural and multilingual workshops. And the title of her talk is The Problem of Machine Translation in Intercultural Collaboration and How to Overcome It. Um, please. Thank you very much, Asher. Can you hear me, Larry? Yes, we hear you well, okay. and we see the, the PPT. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, I'm not an associate professor. I'm an assistant professor. <laughs> so, OK, nice to meet you. And I would like to talk about problem of machine translation that I learned in uh, an ethnographic study. Maybe not, not the problem, but problems, several problems. So a few years ago, uh, we, like I and my professors, conducted an ethnographic study at a children workshop. It's called KISS and it's uh, organized by an NPO called Pangea. You can share this website. So the children are from many various countries, like Korean, Kenya, Cambodia, Japan, of course. And they and the facilitator use machine translation, like in this picture, to discuss. So their goal of this year is a bit different, but that year, the year we observed, uh, their goal was to create a short video, a clay animation together. You know, they have to talk about what, what kind of story they want to make and several things. So they really need their tools because you know, that young uh, children, sometimes uh, they, they cannot really uh, speak second language. Okay, this is how it looks like. To each other. So okay, I'm gonna turn this. The just just look at the video. I'm gonna explain it. So uh, the children doesn't require any shared language, so they work together. But not only with MC, they do like face to face communication, and they also uh, sometimes they also need a interpreter interpreters help, and sometimes they try to communicate by themselves. It is very difficult for them. Okay, so this is how it looks like. And here, what we found, like, it's pretty obvious that uh, the biggest problem is the quality of machine translation because, you know, sometimes it's wrong. Sometimes the translations are wrong, especially for the low resource language. In this case, uh, we have uh, children from Cambodia, so they speak Khmer, and Khmer doesn't have like good resource. So it's difficult for them to participate. And the second, this is not 100% empty fault, but it's happened when we use empty for communication is a cultural, back, cultural background difference, cultural difference. So it can cause misunderstanding. For example, uh, in the workshop, a facilitator asks like, what is it? Because we are doing clay animation. 
and a Japanese child say, uh, it's an angle, it looks like an angle. Angle is a uh, red, red bean pad, it looks like this. And it is uh, translated into red bean pads, but the other kids, non-Japanese, think about the red bean pads as a little bit watery, maybe not like this. So they could understand like why this child say this looks like red bean pads. So we think about it and also uh, we look at how the children cope with the mistranslation. Okay, first, uh, of course, uh, they can try to communicate like uh, face to face using gesture, uh, drawing, or they use picture or they share their screen to show each other, or they can call the interpreter for help. And what the interpreter do is like, uh, they're not, they are volunteers. So they are not professional translator. So uh, what they can do is to try to read an alternative language. Like uh, this, uh, this guy, he's from Cambodia, but he can read in, in English. So he switched the translation language to English and then he read it. So he can explain to the uh, Cambodian kid. Also, sometimes he need to talk directly to the team leader, the, the, the original uh, message sender. Like, what does it mean in, in, in English? So here, uh, what can we solve? How can we, uh, what can we do to solve this kind of problem? So we, we divided the problems into translation-based problem and maybe cultural-based problem. Also, not 100% related with the translation, but still. Related. Okay. Um, there's many. There are many researchers trying to increase the accuracy of matching translation. Like, for example, using back translation or like se several uh, methods to do it, and people still solving it. And another way is to use alternative method to support the uh, communication beside the matching translation itself. For example, we can show the image, or we can show the trans. Uh, alternative translation, or we can adjust the translation result based on like a physical sensing. Like if you if you can detect the if the user have uh, difficulties understanding or not, like you can use eye tracker or something like that and adjust the the translation result. Or we can tell them to use different languages, like use English instead. Don't use machine translation. And maybe for cultural based problem, uh, it may be able to, we may be able to detect the cultural difference or we can want to use it if we know, if we can detect the cultural difference. So, okay, uh, I'm going to talk about the alternative language first. So in some situation, uh, using English or using shell language might be better, but in many situations, using MT might be better, but you know, how, how can we decide? If we have one uh, Japanese this is, uh, that she's not good at English and a shiny who is good at English. In this case, maybe using translations, machine translation is better. But when we have so many people and their skills are various, like, well, what can we do about it, right? Should we use English? Should, should we use MT or should we combine? So in this case, given that Chinese Korean translation is very poor, so maybe a combination of using uh, machine translation and the second language might be good. So a uh, few years ago, we proposed a method called BBMT to help deciding what language to be used. So this might be a bit too long if I explained everything, but okay, for the concept is first we list all the possible language. So we, we have to, we, we need to know the skill of the user so we can ask them how, like how, how much, uh, how many language they can use and how, how well. And also we need to know the machine translation quality. So we can measure that. So we, uh, we separate them into like combinations. For example, English, English, English is when like people, all everybody use English. And maybe this one, Japanese, English, English is like one, one person use Japanese and the other use English. And maybe C1 is everybody use their language, use their own language. So it is just list all the possible combination first, and then we're gonna choose one from this combination. And we use a concept called quality of message. Should we measure how well a message is sent from one person to another? 
for example, uh, here we can calculate the quality of message or QOM by uh, using this person writing skill of one language, multiply by machine translation quality and multiply by the reading skill of the other. And in this, uh, if we calculate all the possible QOM, you can have like this kind of value. So this is from uh, combination one to combination eight, and this is between uh, each users. And so uh, I'm not gonna <laughs> explain this, but uh, we look at the highest QOM. And now we choose it by uh, looking at the Pareto optimal value. So uh, the, the best case is this, you can see the highest number, highest quality of message is C4. And C4, we call it best balance because uh, it might yield the, the best balance. Um, it, it let people, uh, it give people the same opportunity, balance opportunity to use the machine translation. So in C4, the Japanese use Japanese and the other use English. Oh, so this is what we propose. And then we uh, conduct an experiment by comparing the, uh, we let them use English and machine translation. I mean, the full machine translation, like everybody use their own language. And then we use the languages uh, recommended by our BBMT. And I'll go very fast, but the results show that if we use uh, BBMT, uh, the balance is a bit better. So this we call how much people talk here. We call the attendance. So when we use English, the Japanese cannot speak much, but when we use MT and BB, that's not maybe not so much difference. But we can know that BB is better than normal MT uh, when we look at the conversation breakdown where the conversation cannot continue very nicely. So uh, if you look at that, uh, the conversation conversation breakdown if, when we use MT is quite low. So it's quite, uh, flawless. Okay, and another solution I would like to introduce. Actually, we have lots of solutions, but I just chose two. Uh, okay, to detect cultural difference. Okay, this word is uh, dango. It means uh, Japanese sweet. Looks like this. It is translated by MT and maybe by normal interpreter, human interpreter, to dumpling. Maybe human interpreter can get a can come up with a better word like sweet dumpling or something like that. But it looks different and it tastes different. Not, you know, dumpling usually like this. It looks like this, and it's usually not as sweet as dango. So, you know, these these images are from Google, and we're it's the same case as the dango uh, that the Japanese kids talk about and people didn't understand. From this example, we try to come up with an automated method that can help us identify this kind of case, like what word, if it is used, it will cause misunderstanding. So uh, in 2019, we proposed a method called CDD from cultural difference detection. Okay, so this dango, it can be translated to dumpling and then, okay, this we, we might use a uh, machine translation or we can use dictionary or whatever, but uh, to, com to, to test if the machine translation can, uh, can let us communicate uh, correctly, we can use machine translation. Then we search for 30 images or actually 10 is also enough of each in, of, uh, from each keyword. Then we use a computer vision technique to extract the feature. And then we average the features and then we compare. So now we know that uh, these two sets of images are similar or not. If the similarity is high, we hypothesize that there's no cultural difference. But if the similarity is low, we suspect that there might be cultural difference or that it might cause misunderstanding if, if we use uh, this word in machine translation, communicated, communicate, uh, communicated uh, translation. Okay, uh, sorry. And this is what, uh, how we intended to use it. So we have, we develop a system called Modilingo chat system, like it's something like a chat that people can use, uh, can chat with their language and they can see in their language and the other can see in their own language. 
but it is just uh, we haven't developed the, the warning system yet so we create this kind of screen yeah, the, when the Japanese user use the word uh, dango they're gonna be like a pop up or emphasize uh, emphasis that show uh, this gonna be problem or something like that so uh, we want to know if it works or not so we conducted an experiment and our hypothesis was like the user who are warned of this kind of cultural misunderstanding may achieve better communication when they use empty. So, uh, because we cannot uh, develop the, the system that to warn it, actually we can, but uh, it costs a lot. So we, we try the result of awesome method first, but, but we already have the empty uh, embedded chat to use. So uh, we had two groups of participants, a control group and an experimental group. In the experimental group, they received warning when uh, they use a suspect word and because we cannot we are not sure that they were going to use the word that caused misunderstanding so we give them a task uh, each participant was given a list of three items or we cannot call it three choices and they had to share this item we are empty and they have to collaborate collaboratively choose one and we give them a, a difficult situation and they have to choose one that can help them to survive so the control group also uh, given the choice, but without any warning. So we check their understanding by interview after the uh, after the experiment. So we we count how, how many choices they got it correct, and for the experimental group, like hundred percent, all understood very well. And for the control group, like you can see, it's not so much, about seventy percent. So I think it might work. And now we, what are we doing is we are trying to improve CDD for the real, uh, real world use. So we want to implement an empty embedded chat system with the CDD. And also we also study the physical sensing like uh, eye tracking to see the pattern of the uh, misunderstanding or pattern of uh, incomprehensible translation. We also want to create a facilitator agent for intercultural collaboration. Of course, we are matching translation, so it can uh, facilitate across language. And that's all for me. Thank you very much. Th thank you so much, Montero, for a fascinating talk. Um, let's uh, move on to the um, discussion part. We have a short time for Q&A. Um, let me ask, um, let's look at the chat. We have a question for uh, Lucas, uh, noting that it's surprising how cost is only mentioned as the third important factor in preferring machine translation. And maybe your comments on that, Lucas? Um, yeah, I, I was slightly super surprised about, by that as well. I think that's to do with the fact that many people um, in our sample would not pay for translations to begin with. That's not something that would have occurred to them. So I think it's something that, uh, related to what Omi was saying at the beginning, that most people, I think, nowadays come into contact with translation through machine translation. So that's kind of the, the, the status quo and the, 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 the baseline of what translation is, I think, for many people. So um, I think that it's probably to do with that. Um, so many respondents couldn't think of a situation where they would need to hire uh, the services of a translator. To, to follow up on that, um, so in what respect do you think your findings are influenced by the rather dramatic change uh, with introducing of neural machine translation? Um, and I mean, do you think some of, your, some of your findings represent something that's broader in the perceptions and usage uh, that you can differentiate from uh, a, a response to the actual change in, in uh, the quality of machine translation in recent years? Um, I think so. Um, I, think, I think they are broader in the sense that um, I'm not, I mean, we, we didn't ask specific questions about machine translation architectures. So that's the key reason why I think that the findings are broader. So I'm not able to sort of pinpoint what people said about neuro machine translation as opposed to SMT and, and, and et cetera. But, um, at, at the same time, I also think that what neuro machine translation has done is that it has really catapulted machine, not in terms of use and also in terms of hearing about it and reading about it. 
I really think that it's it's more the technology is more in the public eye at the moment, so that would definitely have influenced um, responses uh, somehow. But I'm not able to sort of pinpoint what was said about one architecture as opposed to the other. Thank you, um, Mary. I, I I was wondering if I mean it seems like the the gist the the patent uh, um, professionals. Uh, they, they all they almost seem to be like an extreme case of all gisters or, or maybe um, they, they have this uh, risk literacy um, that, that differentiates them from from other gisters of, of machine translation if you could comment on that and you know commonality you alluded to it uh, but commonalities and differences between um, them the patent users uh, of machine translation and other users yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you. They do seem to be an extreme case of, of having very high literacy about machine translation and risk. I think it's simply because, first of all, it, they do it so frequently as compared to, to occasional people who, who use online MT. But I, a lot has to do with the environment. And I, I think this is one of the huge differences between this kind of use and online use, that the environment supports it. It, it 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 all needs to be understood as having taking place inside this ecosystem of of ipr work which is used to it is very transparent everybody knows who's using mt it's discussed uh, people are trained on it and i think that is the biggest difference in making them like more experienced or more extreme users and high in mt literacy and risk literacy um, so I think that's the biggest difference. And I, I do see huge differences between this type of use and online use. Another way we might be able to learn from them, how did they get to where they are today? But one very important thing is that the study I did, it was very narrow in that they were pretty, the, the people were pretty similar. They were all in Scandinavia and they all had many, many years of experience in patenting. So that also affected it. Thank you, Mary. Um, a question for Montira uh, here in the chat uh, relates to how the accuracy of uh, machine translation is assessed when uh, calculating the uh, BBMT, the best. Uh. Okay, uh, thank you. I didn't have time to uh, explain about that, but there was uh, an existing work how to do it. So we follow the process. So the process is we select some uh, sentences. We see a lot of sentences from a corpus. So this uh, accuracy was calculated earlier before we use it, before we use the MT for uh, daily use. So uh, we select like hundreds of uh, lines from a corpus. And then we have to ask our uh, bilingual, bilingual researcher to check the translation one by one and then we read it. Uh, I forgot how did we read it, but basically uh, fluency and adequacy, like the, the, the correctness and the fluency of it. And I think it is uh, already published somewhere how they, uh, how we can uh, assess the machine translation. So yeah, we followed just the guideline what, what the previous researcher did. Thank you, Motira. Um, did did you I, were, were ordinary users also um, part of the uh, translation quality assessment? Uh, um, yes, they... actually, the you, normal user can can do that too, but because you know sometimes we are not sure that the translation is correct or not. Basically, the fluency normal user, the lay lay user can do it, but uh, for accuracy, we are not sure, right? So. Uh, well, where it is, we, we really ask the, the, the bilingual to help. Thank you. Um, Thank you. If, if there are other questions by um, the speakers, perhaps, or in, uh... Yeah, I have a question for Mondira also, actually. Right. Um, thank you for the presentation. I, I read the paper a long time ago really? and have been following your work, so. My question is about the cultural difference detector. And you said you use images to ascertain whether how similar or, or different image the concepts are. Is that the only thing you use or does it also rely on linguistic information to, to figure out what's similar enough and what's different? I see, that's a nice question. I think the image 
image base has its limitation, you know, because it's image we cannot know the taste of the food or we cannot we cannot know what's inside it. So uh, actually, in our laboratory, we're doing several ways. So image base is just one one way to solve the the problem that uh, inspired by the event that by the kitsy. But uh, now in our lab, we're also working on the vector base. So we create a vector based on, uh, I forgot, I forgot what, but we use word too big to create vector and then we see the difference and the, uh, the similarity. But you know, the, the way they detect is so different. For example, uh, for the thing that's look different, that make people think different, we can use image base. But for example, if we talk about whale, you know that Japanese sometimes eat whale. <laughs> so uh, whale vector will be closer to things like food. But yeah. for maybe English vector, it will not be food or <laughs> something like that. Yeah, so we are working on that too. Okay, really interesting. Yeah, thank you for following my work. So thank you everyone. Um, if there are no other questions, uh, I think we will go to our virtual uh, coffee break and um, we meet again uh, in 15 minutes uh, for our next session. So see you all soon. Omri, should I start? It's already Okay. Um, hi, everybody. It is now 3 p.m., so I want to start our next session. It is my honor and privilege, privilege to do that. I'm Dr. Galia Hirsch from the Department of Translation and Interpreting Studies in Barilan University. And uh, I'm happy to introduce the speakers for our next session. The first one would be Professor Lynn Bocker. Lynn Bocker is a full professor at the School of Translation and Interpretation at the University of Ottawa, where she teaches and conducts research in translation and translation technologies. She is the author of Computer Aided Translation Technology and co author of both Working with Specialized Language, a Practical Guide to Using Corpora and Machine Translation and Global Research. The title of Professor Bocker's talk is Beyond Translation Students Machine Translation Literacy Instruction for Students in Other Disciplines. Before I hand over the, uh, my, the virtual microphone to Professor Bocker, I'd like to remind you all that questions should be written in the chat box and then afterwards I will direct questions to each speaker. So we'll conduct the Q&A at the end of this session. And I, uh, I'd like to remind you to write the name of the presenter you want to address your question to. Uh, thank you. And uh, without further ado, let's hear from Professor Bacher. Is she with us? Um, it's hard to see with so many participants. Um, yes, here I see Professor Bocker. You see Professor Bocker. Um, and I yes. can see your screen just fine. Uh, any problems, any technical problems, you can all address to me in the chat box. Uh, please go ahead, Professor Bocker. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here today. Uh, what I'd like to share with you is my experience over the past academic year where I had the opportunity to teach machine translation literacy to students who are not studying translation. So students in all other programs. I'm going to share a little bit with you about how that experience unfolded over the past academic year. 
So just to situate a little bit the context, um, here in Canada, we have many universities that operate in a sort of bilingual environment with English and French, which are our two official languages. But we also have many students who have maybe immigrated or their parents have immigrated from another region of the world and they have a heritage language. So multilingualism is quite a common feature, I would say, here in Canada. And of course, like other places in the world, we are seeing more and more international students come to our campus. And there are even places in the world where English is not an official language, but they offer courses taught through English. So on campuses all around the world, there seems to be uh, an increasing need for students to operate in a multilingual sort of environment. And so although I've been teaching translation technology to translation students for many years, I have started recently to think about whether there's a, an opportunity or even a responsibility for translation professors to start helping students who are not studying translation to become more literate users of translation technologies. And one of the reasons I've kind of arrived at this situation is because I feel that machine translation is a quite an evolving landscape. If we think about what has happened in the past 70 years, First of all, we've seen a switch where machine translation is not just in the hands of translators or developers anymore, as it was for many years. Now, machine translation, we might describe it as being in the wild. It's out there for anyone who has an internet connection to use, and so many people are using it. The other thing that's interesting about this technology is, although it's very sophisticated behind the scenes, the use, of, the use of this technology is very simple. You don't need a thick user manual. You don't need to invest hours of time learning which buttons to push or where to click. It's really easy to use it. And in some ways, it's almost too easy because when things are very, very easy, it's simple for us to do them in a sort of uncritical way. So there's that to consider as well. And of course, we all know uh, that it, within the past five years, we've seen a, a kind of, again, a radical shift in the underlying approach to machine translation architecture. We're in a data-driven type of situation now where neural machine translation is uh, AI-based. It's a data-driven approach to machine translation. And one of the things that is emerging as a feature of neural machine translation is that it sounds really good. Some of the older approaches to machine translation produced results that were very evidently translationese. And so it was easy to realize that you were dealing with a machine translation output and even you know, fairly easy to spot the problematic areas of the text because they just sounded weird. Now, machine translation output in many cases sounds quite plausible. And so we might get lulled into a false sense of security, not even realizing that we're dealing with machine translation output. So those are some of the things that I think change in the machine translation landscape and sort of um, prompted this need for machine translation literacy among non-translators as well as translators. So we're with a situation where machine translation is easily accessible, very easy to use, and not perfect, but of a higher quality than it used to be. And that does not mean, though, that people instinctively know how to use it or how to use it wisely in a given context. So I have seen this emerging need for what I, I kind of like to describe as machine translation literacy. And what I mean by that is kind of like a combination of digital literacy and information literacy that emphasizes critical thinking rather than technical competence. As I said, it's actually very easy to use the technology. It's thinking about whether you should use it, when you should use it, when it's appropriate, when it's not, how you might as a user interact with the technology to try and, and get better performance out of it. So by asking these types of questions, I think we can become more informed and critical users instead of 
people who are sort of on autopilot, just copy, paste, click. And as I said, I'm kind of, uh, as a translation professor myself, uh, reflect on whether I can help students who are not in the translation program, this uh, machine translation literacy skills development. And I have had the opportunity in the past academic year to be involved in two different courses, both of which are new to me. So I've been teaching translation and translation students for many years, but this past academic year, I had the opportunity to participate in two different courses. And both of these courses were aimed at non-translation students. So the first one was a course which is, uh, described as an interdisciplinary course. Uh, my home university offers the opportunity for professors to take a team teaching approach where they will tackle a particular subject from different perspectives. So I teamed up with a professor from information science and we developed a course called New Literacies for the Digital Age. And this course was offered to all students uh, across the Faculty of Arts. So in our Faculty of Arts, there's 18 different academic units and students uh, who are in any BA program could take this course. So obviously the course was not exclusively on machine translation literacy, but machine translation literacy was one module. So one week of the 12 week course focused on machine translation literacy. And uh, I have uh, some feedback from 67 students who took that course uh, last academic year. I've all been teaching, and this is one that I'm teaching the whole course myself. It's uh, a very introductory course to translation for non-translators. So again, not students registered in our BA in translation program, but this one open to students across the whole campus. So any field at all. And again, machine translation literacy is just one part of this course, one unit uh, out of 12. And I have taught that course to 74 students over the past year, and I'm teaching it actually right now as well in the current summer semester to another 40 students. So there's actually, um, I would say, a appeal. The students who are not in the translation program are interested in translation, and that's really encouraging. So the students came from 42 different programs, everything from fine arts through biology to social work and nursing, environmental science, you name it, they were there. And although most of the students have either English or French as their dominant language, I also have quite a few international students or students who are uh, primarily speakers of another language in the course. And again, quite a variety of languages showed up as uh, as being in, in the student's um, uh, profile. So what might a data uh, machine translation, sorry, what might machine translation literacy module look like? Well, some of the things that we covered, uh, first of all, just very briefly, how neural machine translation works, how data-driven approaches to machine translation work, because this allows students to understand things like how a system can be performing better for one text type than another, or for one domain than another, or why some problems like um, not handling gender might occur in a neural machine translation system. So an understanding of the data-driven approach, I think a allows them to understand the potential problems that they might have or inform their decisions about what text type or what domain or what language are, because low resource languages don't perform as well in a data-driven scenario as high resource languages. So the, the takeaway from this for students is that they can try different machine translation systems and they will get different results. For many students, they had not even been aware that there were other choices beyond Google Translate. So just opening their eyes to the fact that there are different machine translation systems out there and that they might perform differently was an eye opener for them. We also discuss transparency. This could mean, um, you know, just being open about the fact that you're using machine translation, um, labeling it as machine translation output. Uh, and because I'm in an academic context, we talk about academic integrity, whether or not you should be using machine translation for your coursework, how to approach that with your professor. We also talk about risk assessment. 
Uh, this could involve things like just don't put confidential or sen sensitive information into a free online system. A lot of students aren't aware of the fact that uh, companies like Google are, are able to keep your data and uh, reuse it for other purposes. So even that simple warning about not putting, you know, banking details or personal health information into an online free machine translation system. Uh, and then we talk, as some of the previous speakers have, about this idea that there are high risk and low risk tasks uh, using machine translation to translate uh, social media, something for fun, uh, an email to a friend is quite different than trying to use machine translation to write an academic article, for example. And then we talk a bit about interacting with MT, how you can either improve the input by producing a more translation-friendly text or how you might tackle uh, improving the output in a sort of post-editing way. So those are the sort of things that we cover in a machine translation literacy module for non-translators. What I'd like to do now is just share with you some of the feedback that I got from students who took this uh, one of those two courses over the past year. So this is the data from the students who've completed the course, not from the students who are currently taking it. Um, and so I have responses from 141 students. The first thing I wanted to know is how often do you use machine translation? And you can see that it's, it's quite regular. People are using it some every day, most uh, at least once a week or more, a, a few at least a couple of times a month. So it's definitely a technology that they use. It's not something that they're not aware of or have never interacted with. Uh, I also was interested to know what type of activities do you use it for? And I got, again, a quite a variety of responses. Students were allowed to choose more than one, of course, and we see that a lot of them are using machine translation as part of their coursework. Uh, some are using it in their job, and many use it for leisure activities as well. Uh, when I asked them, what do you have machine translation do for you? Is it to help you understand reading and understanding a text, writing a text, or both? And many say they use it in both, for both reading and writing. And so that's important to know, I think, because the type of information we need to give them is different depending on whether they're using it in a, a, for a comprehension purpose or a production purpose. Uh, this is a, a nice follow-up to the question that Lucas received. Uh, what would these students do if no machine translation was available to them? And you will notice, not too surprisingly, that students are not willing to pay for professional translation. So there's no competition here. The type of work that these students are using machine translation for is not business being taken away from a translator because they would not pay a translator. Most of them would ask a friend to help. Some said, ah, nothing, you know, I, would, I just wouldn't do anything. And a few said, I, I would try to translate it myself. I asked them out of all the things they learned in the machine translation uh, literacy module, what item surprised them the most? Or what was something they hadn't been aware of before? And a lot of people said it was this idea of not putting personal information into the online system, but I got quite a few other responses too. This idea of being aware of other tools beyond Google Translate. Like as we as translators, that's not surprising to us, but to these, it genuinely was. The idea of algorithmic bias. So the data, the sensitivity of a machine translation system to the data that it's been trained on. Quite a few were surprised that a good way to get better output from machine translation is to give it better input. Again, not surprising to translators, but very surprising to these students. Okay, I asked them, did they think machine translation literacy was important? Were they happy that they had learned it? Was it something that they felt was you know, worthwhile? And most of them said, at least it was moderately important. Quite a few felt, that it was very important or even essential. Only a few said, you know, it doesn't really seem to be something worthwhile. And finally, I said, 
what about this course, this module? Do you think this is something that we should be doing on a regular basis at the university, either in a course or maybe through a workshop at the library or through the international office? And again, most students seem to see some value in it. Yes, it seems like something that you should be sharing with students across the campus. Okay, and now I can't get to my last slide. <clears throat> So the takeaway that I have from my experience is that machine translation is not going away and non-translators will use it. They are using it. Even if we think it's a bad idea, they're using it. So there's no point in telling them that they shouldn't. They are. Uh, they use it quite often. They use it for multiple reasons. They are not willing to pay for professional translation. Now, again, these are students, so students are in category when it comes to a financial situation, but they're not willing to pay for professional translation. They do find machine translation literacy training to be useful, valuable to them. And this is, I think, something important for us to realize. Things that are obvious to translators are not obvious to non-translators. We do need to tell them things that we think are silly. For them, it's new information. Uh, in my own opinion, I do think that we, as people who have this knowledge, who have this training, should be sharing it with other people and helping other people improve their machine translation literacy. And if you don't have the option or, you know, a opportunity to deliver an entire course, I was quite privileged to have that opportunity, uh, you could perhaps work with someone like the library, the international office, and at least offer some kind of short workshop or, or module for students. Okay, and that's the end. Um, thank you so much. Professor it is always uh, uh, nice to hear people thinking about the use of English for uh, uh, non-English speakers as a translator, former translation translator from Spanish to Hebrew. Uh, I'm highly appreciative of that. And so our next speaker is uh, our very own esteemed colleague, Dr. Emri Asher. He's a senior lecturer at the Department of Translation and Interpreting Studies in Barilan University, of course. Uh, his work explores cultural and ideological aspects of literacy and theological translation, particularly in the framework of homeland diaspora relationships while focusing on contemporary Jewish identities. His book on this subject, Reading Israel, Reading America, The Politics of Translation Between Jews, was published in 2019 by Stanford University Press. His more recent projects deal with the changing landscape of translation in our digital area and examine people's perception of machine translation as a prism through which to understand the human machine relationship. The title of his talk, our next talk, is Human Evaluations of Machine Translation in an Ethically Charged Situation. And uh, before I hand over the microphone to Omri, I'd just like to remind you all that you can post your questions on the chat at every stage of the presentations. Please go ahead, Omri. Thank you, Galia. Uh, first thing, I'll, I'll uh, um, introduce the co-author of this paper, Ella Glickson, as well. Uh, she's a lecturer at the Graduate School of uh, Business Administration at bar -Ilan University, and her research focuses on computer-mediated communication in virtual teams and multicultural contexts, and examines different aspects of human technology and human AI interaction. Her work was published in journals such as Journal of World Business, Journal of Service Research and Social Psychology and Personality Science, and her recent review co-authored with Anita Woolley in 2020 uh, on human trust in artificial intelligence was published in the leading journal of Ac Academy of Management Annals. Um, so let me begin. Um, I, um, I think this, uh, talk relates to uh, Lynn and Mary's notions of risk and trust uh, uh, with relation to machine translation and also to Lucas's um, notion of a high stakes situation. 
Um, so previous presentations have related to different aspects of this wide reading, wide reaching influence of machine translation on communication and understanding in our time. But still a lot remains uh, unknown about the lay use and perceptions of machine translation, which is what this uh, symposium is all about. Um, so our, our work uh, joins the other studies by trying to take a small step um, towards filling this lacuna. And uh, what we did was to examine how the predispositions of users towards machine translation may influence how they evaluate the machine translation product. That is how people's preconceptions um, of machine translation of the tool may impact, perhaps introduce a bias into how they judge the actual translation. And previous studies on automation indeed point in this direction. Uh, studies have shown that users' attitudes to algorithms can influence, for better or worse, how people evaluate uh, an algorithm's effectiveness, authenticity, reliability, etc. And again, these evaluations do not depend only on an algorithm's actual usefulness or ease of use or even its quality, uh, as is assumed in, in many studies. No, they, they are contingent upon human perceptions and predispositions towards algorithms. So um, not so much the product itself as how our mind is predisposed to uh, frame it. So based on this premise, our study, our experiment, examines how people evaluate machine translation um, in an ethically charged situation in the context of immigration. Now, the fact that human uh, translation in immigration contexts is often governed by power relations um, is well known and, and much studied. Uh, but what is perhaps less acknowledged uh, is that with the rise of the quality of machine translation and the ubiquity of its use, ethical dimensions have become relevant to machine translation use, use as well. Uh, machine translation is already used in uh, immigration situations of power imbalance between communities, between languages. Uh, we have seen this in uh, Lucas's um, and, and, and others work here. Uh, researchers um, that take part in this symposium have uh, explored this fact and contributed to our knowledge on it. Uh, they touched on how machine translation is used uh, for linguistic accessibility in context of public health, of civic participation, uh, public libraries and medical and legal circumstances. And as implied in these studies, using machine, machine translation to address the communication needs of immigrants, uh, of immigrant communities may have important uh, social implications, again, for better or worse. And with the way machine translation is going, uh, the volume and scope of these situations, it's only likely to increase. Um, as, as Lucas described it, it's, it's the common point of departure uh, um, uh, has recently become. So in light of all this, um, our experiment tried to examine if users evaluate differently, um, judge differently the features of an otherwise identical translation when it is attributed to a human or a machine. Um, and we were particularly interested in how this manifested in an immigration situation uh, of power imbalance in a, an ethically charged immigration situation. So what was the basic method of our experiment? Um, we drew on methodology that has already been used in uh, previous studies on human attitudes to artificial intelligence. Um, so basically, we distributed an online questionnaire that described a situation in which an immigrant worker needed a, a translation in order to submit a complaint. Um, I'll elaborate on the scenario soon. Participants were uh, randomly assigned to one of these two conditions, meaning that approximately half of the participants were told that the translation of the immigrant's complaint was done by a professional human translator, and the other half were told that the human translator was unavailable. Uh, so the text was translated uh, with machine translation. However, all, um, all, translate, all participants were presented with the same exact translation and source text. So identical translation source text in both conditions and the exact same scenario, exact same questions. 
Um, and then the, quest the questionnaire asked the participants to evaluate um, the features of the translation, the features of the situation. And when, what we wanted to see um, is if the fact that the translation was assigned to a human uh, or a machine, if it influenced people's evaluations. Um, if this sole difference, remember it's, the ident it's an identical translation. Um, if the sole difference led them to evaluate differently uh, an identical translation only because of their preconceptions of machine translation and human translation. So just a few words uh, about the scenario itself. Uh, participants were presented with a situation in which an immigrant worker in Israel was assaulted by uh, security guards due to misidentification. And in order to request compensation, he needs to provide an official letter in the local language in Hebrew. Because he doesn't know the local language, he writes um, his complaint in basic English, which then needs to be translated into Hebrew for the village officials. Um, our sample included more than 280 participants uh, that took part in the survey. You can see before you some of the demographics, uh, perhaps most relevant to us are the last two lines. Uh, we're talking about mainly lay users, which means no professional experience in translation, but also a smaller portion of people with um, previous experience in translation. So this allowed us to compare the two groups. Um, also worth noting is that most participants were highly fluent in both source and target languages. They knew English, they knew Hebrew well, uh, so they could actually compare the source text and the translation when they evaluated the translation. Um, a methodological note, uh, this identical translation that was um, presented to all participants was done by Google Translate. Um, remember that we needed the translation to plausibly pass also as a human translation for the condition for the participants who were told that the translation was uh, done by a, a professional human translator. So, the original uh, English message had to be fairly simple um, in terms of syntax, in terms of words, word choice, and the source text also had to be somewhat fine-tuned, uh, pre-edited, so the translation uh, produced by Google Translate won't have uh, any grammatical errors or lexical peculiarities, so it would plausibly pass as a human translation. Um, but this basic English, it should be said, uh, also made sense in our scenario. Um, it was realistic. Uh, it corresponded with the level of English proficiency of most immigrant workers uh, in Israel. So it made sense that the complaint would be written in that uh, basic English. Um, so now, how did we ask uh, people to evaluate the translation? So we decided to base our criteria on three basic um, categories. In the first category of evaluation, we asked participants to evaluate the accuracy and reliability of the translation. Uh, using a seven-point Likert-like scale, we asked them to rate uh, statements. We asked them to rate uh, the extent to which they agreed with statements such as the translation is accurate, the translation is reliable. The second category um, we wanted people uh, to evaluate uh, was the ability of the translation to convey cu cultural otherness or emotional and cultural otherness which if you recall the scenario uh, fits well with uh, um, the need from the translation uh, uh, in the situation at hand. So we asked participants to rate again from one to seven statements such as the translation succeeds in conveying the immigrant workers, the, the immigrant was named L, uh, the immigrant workers feelings, um, the translation succeeds in bridging the cross-cultural gap, between L and the local culture, the translation succeeds in conveying the otherness of L's cultural background to the authorities, etc. cetera. Um, for our third category, uh, which you see before you, we asked participants to uh, evaluate the translation's functional effectiveness in the situation at hand. And by this, we mean the extent to which the translation is expected to help the plight of the immigrant in need of the translation. So we asked participants to rate statements such as uh, the translation may help L 
in terms of the treatment he receives from the village officials. The translation may help El receive what he wants. The translation may help El deal with the situation he got involved in. Um, so these were uh, the major criteria, uh, but we also asked participants if they felt the need to reshape the original message and introduce changes to the translation in order to help the immigrant worker in need of the translation. So in other words, if they felt the need to intervene and post edit the translation. So we, we were interested not only in what people think about the translation, uh, but also how may they suggest to act with regard to the translation. And again, we wanted to see if all these evaluations and beliefs were different when this identical translation was attributed, was told to the participants that it was done by a machine or was done by uh, a human translator. Um, one last thing before I present the results of our experiment, um, when a translation is attributed to an algorithm, to uh, automation, there is another important dimension uh, that needs measuring. Scholars have demonstrated that when people evaluate a technology, uh, when they evaluate uh, AI or, or other technologies, they're influenced by their previous expectations of that technology. In other words, whether the performance of that technology was seen to exceed expectations or fall below expectations, that influences how they, um, that how they eventually evaluate the quality or other features of the, um, of the technology. So in our experiment, we also checked uh, the extent to which uh, people were positively or negatively surprised um, in order to see if this played a role in determining how people actually evaluated the translations. So what were our re results? Um, I won't go into the details of the statistics, uh, we're glad to send the full article to anyone who is interested. Um, it's forthcoming in uh, the journal New Media and Society. Um, what we generally found was, so first of all, assigning the translated text to an algorithm or a human indeed influences participants' perspectives on the translation. Okay, the mere knowledge or, or, or uh, um, uh, assigning the translation to a human or a machine influenced what people thought uh, of the features of the translation. Um, generally, people tend to exhibit a negative bias uh, to the machine translation product and assign its features with lower evaluations. Um, all evaluations of the translation, uh, again, once the effect of prior expectations was taken into account, were significantly lower in the machine translation condition. Uh, ac the accuracy and reliability, the ability to convey emotional and cultural otherness, uh, the functional effectiveness um, in helping the, the uh, immigrant worker in, uh, that needed the translation, all these were evaluated um, lower when the translation was attributed to a machine. And remember, it's an identical translation. We also found that the degree of positive surprise from the machine translation product influences the eventual outcome of people's evaluations. Okay, the prior expectations and how people were positively surprised also influenced um, how people evaluated the translation. I will get to this, um, I will elaborate on this soon. Um, and one final thing, uh, our results also demonstrated how um, the lower evaluations people had for the machine translation product, um, the fact that they were biased and gave a lower uh, rating to uh, the features of the machine translation, led them to a stronger wish to intervene, to post edit the translation, uh, so as to help the immigrant in need of the translation. So uh, to conclude, the wish to act upon the translation by post editing it, this was significantly higher in the machine translation condition. Um, so before I conclude this part, let me say one thing about the effect of prior expectations um, and what happens when these expectations uh, are disconfirmed. Now, in both conditions, all participants who were more positively surprised by the translation assigned it with higher grades. You were, more po you were positively surprised, you gave it a higher grade. Um, however, 
participants who were told the translation was produced by a machine, by machine translation, tended to have lower expectations to begin with. Therefore, they were also generally more positively surprised of the translation quality. And this positive surprise that they had that led them to a higher uh, rating reduced, it diminished the negative effect of their bias against the machine. So the positive surprise lessened the particular negative effect that attribu attributing the translation to the machine had uh, on their evaluations. Um, another part of our findings is what didn't influence people's evaluation. Um, so this includes participants' age, gender, uh, professional experience, uh, previous experience with machine translation, their politics, their immigration politics, um, their perspectives on the unjustness of the situation. None of this influenced people's evaluation of the machine translation. Um, and interestingly, we also found no difference between lay users and people with professional translation experience. So both populations uh, exhibited the same exact inclinations, the same exact biases um, in their evaluations of the translation. So to conclude, um, the findings of our study show uh, for the first time, as far as we are aware, that the negative predisposition towards machine translation, at least in the scenario that we described, uh, leads to a bias in the evaluations of various features of the machine translation product. Um, our findings also demonstrate the important role played by prior expectations um, from machine translation, the disconfirmation of these prior expectations together with the negative bias against machine translation conjointly determine the eventual outcome of people's evaluations. So both of these taken together uh, determine people's evaluations. So of course, uh, future research is still needed, um, particularly to determine in, much, in what ways might this um, lack of trust in machine translation influence communication and in um, uh, the various situations uh, that we heard throughout this uh, symposium, the various situations in which machine translation is used. Um, so for instance, might uh, this bias cause stronger elements of society to believe they're having a less meaningful interaction with disadvantaged lay users of machine translation, users who may strongly rely on this technology for communication, there's still much work to be done on the subject. I'll conclude. What's clear is that the bias against machine translation may have broad implications for uh, intercultural communication worldwide. And thank you, Dr. Asher, and of course, Dr. Glickson, the author of this very interesting research. And I have to admit that I'm happy with the results that we're still not disregarded as people and replaced by machines, but that's just my personal opinion. Our next speaker is uh, Mariana J. Martindale, which is a PhD candidate in information study at the University of Maryland. She received her uh, BS in computer science from Brigham Young University in 2003 and MS in linguistic computational from Georgetown University in 2007. Since 2003, she has worked on, team, on a team that supports, builds, and deploys machine translation systems primarily to non-translator users in the real world. And her research focuses on machine translation reliability and user experience. And Mariana's talk is titled, Believability and Misleading Machine Translation. And the floor is yours. Is, um, is Mariana with us? Uh, yes, okay. And let me remind you all that you can still post some of your questions on the chat box. Uh, go ahead, please, Ms. Martindale. Um, hi, so as, as was said, I'm Mariana Martindale and I'm speaking on recent work that was presented at the uh, HCI and NLP human computer interaction and uh, bridging human computer action and natural language processing workshop at EACL. Um, last month. And uh, this is going a little bit more into um, 
some of the character, some one specific aspect of machine translation and looking at how that may affect sort of a broad variety of, of use cases. So we know from, uh, PowerPoint is not cooperating with me. Hang on a second. Okay, we know from experience that machine neural machine translation scores really well on automated metrics and human evaluations. And it's available in more platforms and languages than ever. And it improves so many types of errors, particularly fluency. So you see things like with this really low resource language of Hawaiian, um, you get this beautiful downright idiomatic translation in English from Google Translate back in September. Only there is in fact more to it than meets the eye because sometimes machine translation can fail catastrophically. Like in this example where the text was not actually Hawaiian. It's not really text at all as you might guess by the fact that there are only a handful of letters in it. And um, this is the kind of error that, that we would call hallucination where the machine translation output is just totally unrelated to the input. I threw up a couple of other examples here. And um, these are sort of extreme examples where uh, in, in a couple of these cases, the MT is faced with nonsense. And so it's producing fluent English anyway, uh, though the exception to that is the white sea lasers example, which was, um, which was probably just an unknown word where it didn't where it hadn't seen lasagna in all caps before. And so it was just guessing something, the, the closest thing it could find, which was lasers. Um, and the thing about all of these translations is, would you guess that the output was actually correct? We look at these, we laugh at them, we say, ha, ha, ha. And then it concerns us a little bit because they're so wrong. But the thing is, you can tell that they're wrong. And so that's telling us something about it, that an inadequate translation is not necessarily going to mislead the user. So what actually is misleading? Well, okay, it definitely has to be not correct if it's going to mislead the user, we know that much. But the key thing is that the user also thinks that it's correct. And this is the thing that, that uh, we're going to be calling believability. So we define that as the user's perception of the likelihood that the meaning of the MT output matches the meaning of the input text without understanding the input. And this is a new concept for machine translation. We usually think about machine translation in terms of quality and, and evaluation and is it, is it right or is it wrong? But this is really more, less of a quality feature and more of a user experience feature. It's grounded in the MT output itself, but it's gonna be influenced by the user's knowledge and experiences and biases. Um, so let's hone in on that and try and figure out some of these things that might influence it. Intuitively, we know that it's going to be features that the user can recognize without understanding the source. Um, and if we go into the literature to try and figure it out, if we look at the MT evaluation literature, there's a lot of focus on adequacy and fluency as these big sort of uh, monolithic categories uh, in that the that MT researchers tend to focus on. And so if you're going to divide up all of the possible errors that machine translation can have into adequacy and fluency, then it seems kind of like, well, a monolingual user can't really judge the adequacy. So probably fluency is, is a thing that's going, that's going to influence them. If we branch out a little further into the credibility literature, there's, there's a few different kinds of credibility. There's source credibility, which in this case would be, for example, the provider of, of the MT, whether it's Google or Microsoft or, or whoever, and the medium, medium credibility, which is related to it, how people are actually experiencing the machine translation, for example, the user interface. And those things are probably relevant in real deployed situations. But for the purpose of this small study, we wanted to focus on just the message or content credibility. So we're focusing, honing in on those features and, and trying to um, hold the, we're, we're not talking about where the MT came from or how it's being displayed to the user holding those things constant. And the features that come up that are related to that are things like reasonableness and grammatical errors. And reasonableness is gonna be things like semantic plausibility or coherence. Like, does it seem weird that this sentence is, is showing up in the middle of all of the other sentences? And, um, and uh, plausibility, like, does it even make sense in the first place? 
and uh, grammatical errors, which are really closely tied into that fluency concept or, or the way that MT researchers tend to define fluency, which may or may not exactly map to how real, how people annotating fluency define it, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> um, so what we want to do specifically with believability is to collect annotations on MT output and try and look at the relationships between some of these properties. So specifically believability and fluency and, um, and then try and go back and see how it relates to things like plausibility and so forth. So what we did was we took um, output from machine translation systems that were trained on a general domain data and used them to translate, um, use the machine translation systems to translate uh, TED Talks. But of course, with the with the TED Talks, they're all given in English and human translators translate them into other languages. And so you have in this particular set of data, the these are the same TED Talks with the exact same English source. Human translators have translated them into other languages. So they're lined up um, across these languages, which makes it an interesting comparison to look at because the underlying content and subject matter is gonna be the same across all of these different kinds of, of text that we're using. But we are cheating a little bit by using source text that's actually human translations and sending those translations back through machine translation into English. Um, but because we're really just looking at these specific properties, the, the hope is that may, is that uh, some of the translation ease effects and so forth will, will even out across them. Um, so why these specific MT models? We want to produce the full spectrum of adequacy, believability, and fluency levels. So we don't want to use the best possible optimized to this data machine translation. We want to use something that's going to actually make enough errors that we can compare against each other. So we use a variety of languages and different training data sizes and model performance. Um, and which is which is shown in the table here to ensure that we're actually going to get some some interesting examples to look at. But the other thing is that means that the distribution of each of these individual labels is not going to be something that's really relevant or regenerized to other MT systems. So I'm not even going to mention it. The thing we're really focusing on is the relationships between these labels. So the annotators in this case are salaried translators, which is going to sound weird since the whole point of this is to talk about how, how um, users that don't know the language are, are reacting to machine translation. Uh, the reason why we did this, and I'm going to explain how we set it up so that, so that that works in, in a second. The reason why we did this is that uh, we had access to them and that they would give more attention to detail than crowd workers that are being paid by the example. and. Um, the fact that they have sort of that they have a similar background to each other gives us good annotator agreement. There are good things and bad things about this. As an initial study, it's good to have that similar. But as I mentioned before, this is something that's probably going to be subjective and vary by users. So it's really important in future work to try this across other different backgrounds and um, and get some uh, and find out whether different how different kinds of users react to these things. But as an initial study. This, this gets us, uh, at least gets it started. And so what they did, what we had them do is take two passes through blocks of, of text from these TED Talks in order. And the first pass through, they would look only at the MT output. So they didn't get to see the source at all. So this is the part that's simulating not knowing the language because they just don't get to see it in this case. And uh, they were asked for each, for each segment to rate the fluency and the believability of it. And then they go back through the same chunk of segments and are shown both the source and the empty output and are asked to, add, to score the adequacy for it. So the first time through, they're sort of predicting what the adequacy is going to be. And the second time through, they are actually rating it given the input. Um, for analysis, we're going to do a little bit of quantitative, we're going to do a fair amount of quantitative and a little bit of qualitative to sort of pin down and dig down into the details here. Um, so I'm going to throw up some pie charts and the uh, the key thing to notice on you, these pie and, charts. Mariana, just wanted to remind you that you have four minutes tops. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's that's fine. Um, so these are um, out of all of the ones that are not 
adequate, the ones that are not correct, how many of them are actually misleading? Um, and we see across these three languages that the um, that it's a little, it, it's closer to, these numbers are closer together than, than, uh, than I would have predicted actually across these different values. Um, about three quarters to four fifths of the time that there is an error, the user would guess that it is an error and not actually be misled by it. So the good news is that a lot of the time the users wouldn't be, be misled. The bad news is that's still a big chunk of the time that users would be misled. And what's really interesting is that the highest quality model, the Arabic, had fewer translations that were inadequate total, but of those translations, slightly more of them were misleading, which is really interesting. When we flip that around and look at of the translations that are correct, that are adequate, how often would the user not believe it? How often are they not believable? And these numbers are, are much closer together. Uh, between 15 and 20% of the time that the user, that the output is adequate, the user would reject it as likely incorrect, but most of the time they would actually accept it. Uh, and again, we see that the Arabic model, the, high, the Arabic English model, the highest quality model had the largest percent believable. So putting those two things together, it makes us think that perhaps the Arabic model, which had much, much more training data, has actually learned to be more believable regardless of accuracy, which is interesting. Now, going back to that question of what believability actually is, is it just fluency? Um, we see really strong correlation between fluency and believability, particularly for the Farsi and Korean, but for the Arabic English, again, the higher quality model with the more, tra with the more training data, there's a little bit more of a difference. And this suggests that maybe as we get stronger models, we're gonna need more nuanced believability measures than just the fluency judgment that, um, that NT researchers have, have been used to looking at. So if we go into qualitative observations, we see that unbelievable translations are often failing semantically. So for example, so I've, I've put up just a few examples here. The user um, will see something like, we need a human body, we should eat it, and think that maybe that's not really what was intended to be said in a TED talk. Um, but when we get to the translations that are, that are disfluent, so we would expect them to not be believable. They, they are still believable when they are making some of these grammatical, only making these grammatical errors and not making semantic errors. So these are function words. These are, um, these are sometimes the kinds of errors that you might expect, say, a non-native English speaker to make. You still know the meaning, but it just feels like it's not grammatically correct. So to summarize all of that, um, in this sort of whirlwind pass through. We know that NeuralMT makes peculiar mistakes, which are sometimes funny, but they can sometimes be misleading. And knowing about believability helps us understand how users will actually view those mistakes. And we see that output that is semantically plausible may still be incorrect, and higher quality models may be more believable even when they are, even when they are incorrect. So how do we use this information? We want to educate users and make better user interfaces. So for example, all of those, all of those wonderful um, MT literacy things we just heard about in, in the previous talk, we can roll them out to users as much as possible and help them know the kinds of errors that it can make. We can also think about ways to prompt users to potentially recognize these kinds of, these kinds of things like we saw in, um, in one of the talks this morning where they gave a little, bit of a, a little bit of a nudge to say, hey, this might not be perfect. And it made such a big difference. If we have some way of recognizing, um, of recognizing when there may be an issue with the translation and when it may be more believable, we could flag it for the user and help them, fig and help them make a better judgment about whether, it's, whether it is going to be accurate or not. And I will leave you with this with this translation, which is a uh, which is believable to someone who is not fluent in the target language, and not so believable to someone who actually knows it. And thank you, Mariana, for a fascinating talk. I think actually people who speak Spanglish do use exito as a, as an exit instead of salida, but I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, we had a lot of. Uh, 
questions and discussions on the chat. So I'd just like to uh, choose two more prominent ones. Some of you have already answered each other, but there was a very interesting question directed to Professor Walker, which was basically uh, if students were a uh, uh, actually affected by the existence of machine translation and that is why nowadays they believe they should not be paying for translation so in other words is the influence of machine, machine translation that of not paying a, a qualified translator so this was directed to professor Bocker. thank you yes it's a great question and i suspect that it's a combination of factors so absolutely, students who are first year undergraduates today have grown up in a world where free online machine translation is the norm. So that definitely could be a factor. Uh, but I think also we have to recognize that students in general don't have a lot of money. So this is not a category of um, customer who would ever be, you know, anxious to pay for something um, because students generally don't have a lot of money. But also, um, I, I think it's important to recognize the types of activities that students were using machine translation for. Many of them were using it for leisure activities. So again, you know, if they're if their machine translation of the manga comic that they're reading is not perfect, they're not too upset about that. They can still get the gist and they're happy. So leisure activities, they're probably not willing to pay for. And also they were using it for their coursework. So there may have been a little bit of hesitation around the idea of, you know, paying someone else to essentially do their coursework. They, they may have, you know, were constantly drumming into them, um, you know, academic integrity and plagiarism things. So that also could have been a factor. Students are perhaps a special category. For, for many reasons. So I suspect it's a combination of factors why they weren't interested in paying for professional service. Thank you. So we have just one more minute left. I'd like to raise the one issue that received a lot of comments on the chat, and that is uh, referring to Dr. Asher and Dr. Glickson's uh, study. So people commented on the uh, negative perception of machine translation and they were curious about it. So I was wondering maybe Dr. Asher or Dr. Glickson would you like to comment on that? Mm. Um, I think, um, yeah, Lucas also, I, I see you're answering, Anna, um, about the mistrust, the, like the negative bias or the mistrust in machine translation uh, uh, stemming from bilingualism. And I mean, it may, it may be, um, mm. that makes sense in one respect, but I think there's also something to add uh, that problematizes that is that um, there are research, uh, there are studies that show that if you don't know how the algorithm works, um, you're also uh, prone to, to distrust it. So there's that and that, and they both, uh, um, they're both factors that should be taken into account. Thank you. So that's very interesting, but I think that's con that concludes our, and this present section, and we are going to move on to the round table. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Galia. Thank you so much. So um, we, we virtually move to the round table uh, part, our final session. Um, thank you again for joining us. And uh, thank you so much to Lynn, Mariana, Lucas, Mary, and also Montira. I think she's not here anymore, but um, considering it's nearly midnight uh, in Japan, um, that's completely understandable. Um, so following your individual contributions, um, I wanted to ask each of you um, from your own research perspective, uh, a question about the kind of collective future of, of this subfield, uh, uh, this subject of research. Um, what, how do you see uh, the most pressing lacunas in our knowledge uh, of lay use and perceptions of, of uh, machine translation? Where would you like to see this field of research um, develop in the next five years? Um, so perhaps Lynn, if, if you care to begin. Thank you. It's a great question. And I'm so excited by, the, by having participated today and seeing all the different approaches to it. I really think that it is time for us to look at the lay years. They have been almost absent, as you mentioned in the opening from uh, studies uh, over the past you know, 50, 60 years. And so it's great. I really believe that machine translation is not a one size fits all solution. 
And the problems arise when we treat it that way. So what I would like to see is, is just more studies of users in very different scenarios. Um, and we've seen already today, like a sort of extreme examples of the, the patent professionals who are professionals versus, you know, graduate students who are not. And so I would really just like to see more studies of different users. I mean, um, something that came out of uh, Lucas's presentation at the beginning was how uh, machine translations represented in the press. So journalists could be a fantastic kind of uh, case study. Um, also, I think catching students even younger. So I was working with first year students this past year, but I think high school students, um, high school students also use these tools. So that that's another group that there are almost an endless number of possibilities and, and just having more lay user studies would be fantastic as far as I'm concerned. Mariana, would you like to also add perhaps? Um, I, I would underscore everything Lynn said. I think that um, uh, a lot of what basically, I, I mean, the big summary would be more of everything we saw today. So a lot of, a lot of looking at specific use cases, looking at how people are actually are actually using it in, in their lives and and sort of looking at the connection between um, and the interactions between how the characteristics of the user and the characteristics of the use case of why they're using it and the characteristics of the MT itself come together in um, in interesting ways and um, in like we've seen in, in all of these examples today and, and trying to take the next step on that to say, okay, now that we've seen all of these, all of these properties of use cases and users and whatever, are there things, are there ways that we can improve, um, you know, we've heard about improving the user's understanding of it. Can we improve the way that machine translations are presented to users to help them, um, to help them interpret them better? Uh, we even saw, we even heard a little bit about one of the examples of that in, in one of the one of the other talks, and um, and to really help guide them to understanding better with and without training. So, um, yeah, mostly all of the above, all of everything we've done. Keep doing more. Lucas, would you like to also perhaps comment on on the collective future of the field? Yeah, uh, so I, I agree with all of that. I think we need more um, of these studies. And um, one thing that struck me doing this research is that uh, is how much I think we all have to learn from lay users. Because we say lay users, but it's lay lay from our perspective, right? Because quite quite often there will be highly specialized professionals in their own areas um, who will not have. Uh, the knowledge of languages and linguistics that we would, but would have this very, you know, enriching knowledge of their fields that we need as well to understand how communication works. And one specific detail that I think struck us in analyzing these results is the difference between translation and interpreting. Struggles, I mean, sounds trivial, I, I would say. Um, so, uh, and we often, you know, correct everyone, oh, that, that's, that's interpreting, that's not translation. Um, I wonder if that's starting to change, and I wonder the role of technology uh, in that as well. Because some of the examples that we came across, you know, the immigration officer typing a sentence into Google Translate and then trying to read that out loud, and the technology itself and how it's translation at the core, but then there are all aspects of different aspects of speech involved in that. Um, I wonder what technology is doing to, to, to that difference that we deem quite, you know, uh, fixed between translation and interpreting. And I wonder. If convincing, carrying on convincing so-called lay, lay users about their differences is a losing battle. I, I wonder, that's a question that I um, have been asking myself. So more collaboration, I think, between interpreting research and translation research. And this, you know, there's a major, huge body of work on public service interpreting and, and the role of you know, the interpreter as a conduit in, in, in different situations. And I think we need to marry up these different areas uh, a bit more, which is something I would like to see. Thank you, Lucas. Um, you convinced me. Um, Mary, would, would you like to also comment? Yeah, <clears throat> I think that we're in the situation right now that the internet was, <clears throat> excuse me, at the beginning. So <clears throat> at the beginning, everybody was concerned with the technology. All of the conferences, they talked about the technology of the internet. 
<clears throat> I read a description from a, a researcher that he would go to these conferences and talk about the user and the, the reception was pretty much like, that's really interesting. Let me tell you about the technology. And I, and I feel like in machine translation, we're pretty much at the same place. Like the, the focus until now has been entirely on the technology and for good reason, of course. But at some point, somebody needs to come along and say, well, what about how people are using it? Could we take a look at that? And I, I feel we're, we're on the cusp of that right now. And yes, I can hear you, sir. Excuse me? Anyway, what I would love to see is I would love to see the emergence of a new field, a new discipline called MT user studies, which would converge the studies being done on translators and the studies being done on lay users, because they're all users of the technology and as a group, much more different than the technology studies, than they are different from each other. Um, Mariana, building, building on, on uh, what Mary uh, uh, just said, when you consider in particularly uh, the risks that lay users uh, um, face, you know, when, when using uh, machine translation that many here uh, uh, show the risk of the machine translation uh, product being inadequate, um, how would you like, like to see the relationship between us as researchers um, and perhaps the machine translation programmers the language industry uh, in general? I mean, should there be a concrete relationship uh, between these stakeholders? So I think um, a, a, big, a big part of that, I, I, in short, yes, I think that there, there are important relationships. I sort of imagine the ideal collaboration to be, um, to be the, the translation studies community, which has a lot of experience in assessing the kinds of risks that can come with the kinds of translations that translation that translators are doing and the the kinds of mi and miscommunications and things like that that can happen in the translation process and that is going to be really informative ex really in informative experience um, and then the MT researchers and developers are familiar with the strengths and weaknesses of the technology but I think it's really important to also bring in the human computer interactive interaction and um, cognitive science and information studies communities to, uh, to look at, um, th that are familiar with things like how people look for information in, in general and particularly in, in, um, in the language they speak and moving that into, okay, how are they looking for information when, they're, when they have other languages and looking at what are technological interventions that may help users to use the, use the translations more effectively. And I think if, you, if we can get synergy sort of across all of those fields, then they can feed back to each other in, in terms of, you know, uh, if, if we learn that there are certain kinds of, of mistakes that are gonna be more problematic for users, then the MT developers can help the, guide the MT systems towards not making those kinds of errors instead of this broad, general, oh, we want it to be good, um, <laughs> make it accurate, and then and not really, we have the technology now that we could really help gear the, the, the MT systems to, um, to work the way we want if we had the understanding of the use cases and the users to, uh, to guide that. Um, so that's sort of the, the ideal thing that I would see in terms of, of figuring out what the risk is from what we know about translation and figuring out how to help it from what we know about the technology and about people as users of technology. Lynn, um, this, this connects, thank you, Mariana, for a great uh, uh, proposal. This connects, I think, uh, directly to much of your work on, on which is applicative, right? I mean, uh, um, so how, how would you think the study of, of lay use, uh, building on what Mariana said, uh, lay use and perceptions of machine translation, uh, where can it be most applicative and, and why? Yeah, I'm, I was really happy to hear Mariana make connections between, um, in particular, uh, translation and information studies. I'm a cross-appointed professor between the School of Translation and the School of Information Science, and a lot of my work takes place at the intersection of those two fields. And I really see machine translation as, a, like I said, a kind of machine translation literacy is kind of combination of digital literacy, but also information literacy. How are we accessing information through the medium of machine translation? 
And I really feel that, you know, getting this integrated into information literacy education is key. And as I said uh, a few minutes ago, I think it starts earlier than first year university. Like that's the group I've been working with because that's the group I have easy access to and it was a you know, reasonable place to start. But information literacy is taught to much younger students. And I think that there's definitely a scope for starting this type of information earlier and not waiting till they get university because not everyone goes to university, but there are you know people who are outside of, of a university environment who use machine translation. So it, it to me, it makes a lot of sense to kind of move this down the pipeline, if you will, to kind of younger uh, students as, as part of an information literacy, digital literacy, package. Thank you, Lynn, for a great comment. I think it, uh, it, it corresponds directly to Maureen's uh, uh, question in the chat that we let you answered it uh, of pushing the education earlier in the in the uh, um, yeah, process of, of uh, getting to know it and getting to um, get a feel for it. Lucas, do you, do you also um, how, how would you uh, look at the applicativeness of the uh, the, the research. Um, yeah, I think I think education is absolutely key, and that that is probably the first thing that would that I would um, think of. Um, and I think after, uh, um, I mean, thinking of other factors, something that I ask myself is, what do we do about constituencies that are already using it in situations where perhaps it should not be used? And and I don't think that we have the frameworks to deal with some of the consequences. Of this. So when, when we post something on social media, we it, that might get machine translated on the other end, and we might not be aware of it. So we don't we don't have any control of whether or the extent to which the user on the other side is translating that, and that has led to a mistaken arrest three years ago. There was a, an example that was in the news. An extreme case, I think it happened only once, but I think it's it's interesting to make us think. Um, what are, what are the consequences? Um, of that situation of it happening in that you know in that context. So. I think that there's room for this uh, to be uh, included in policy, for, for this to be, for, for, for that situation uh, uh, to be um, foreseen and, and for that to be uh, um, included in what we should do, should that happen. Um, so I think that there's more room to apply uh, some of these results in that way as well. Do you think this connects to um, artificial intelligence mediated communication more generally? Because we're talking about the machine translation case study, but really, if we kind of take a step back, we can think of it as part of a, a, a you know, a, a, a maglum of, of, of um, technologies that are increasingly used and um, that fit your description. So I think it does, but I think it's slightly different as well, because there's a lot of research on, for example, face recognition and, and when or not to use it. But the reality is I can't go online and use a top-notch you know face recognition system right now at least maybe that's available and I'm not aware of it but I don't I don't think that the most sort of uh, advanced face recognition models would be at your fingertips and and that easily on your phone but we have a very advanced neuro machine translation system I mean multiple fairly advanced neuro machine translation systems that are available to everyone at all times so I think that the widespread access to high quality systems is probably something that we see more strongly with machine translation and perhaps some other technologies, but compared to some of the other research that I've seen on, on AI ethics and, and, and so on, they tend to, to be based on technologies that I don't think are as available and as widespread as machine translation at the moment. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's a great, um... So you pointed the differentiation as well. I think that maybe um, a connection to AI MC, like artificial intelligence mediated communication can also point to the differences as well, like commonalities and differences to uh, clarify the um, uh, non-translator use of uh, machine translation. Um, Mary, would, would you um, want to comment on, on um, how the knowledge that's already been acquired in machine translation, in, in translation studies um, about the use and perceptions uh, by professional translators, does that inform our study of uh, lay users or non-translator users um, approaches to machine translation? Can it be used? Is it part of the field? 
Yeah. So even though I, I just said we should have a new field of study that would combine these, I also see a need to make sure that we keep them separate and, and be very careful about assuming that the needs and ways of using MT of translation professionals would be the same as those of lay users. Um, Sharon O'Brien said in, in a study on cog cognitive factors in 2017 that, well, it talked a lot about how she's how it's seen for the translators, and then at the end said, however, these should not be taken as a proxy for how lay users see it. Uh, they, they, it tells us very little about the lay user. And my own thought, although this is not backed up by study yet, is that the, the different responsibilities that lay users have and tra professional translators have cause a big difference in the way they approach MT. And by responsibilities, I mean that the, the lay user is often responsible only to themselves. Once they understand it to the point they need, they're fine. Whereas a professional translator has a great number of responsibilities to all kinds of people and they, they need to make sure they understand it at a much deeper level than a lay user. So I think we have to be careful of that at all times and, and simply taking something that worked here and applying it somewhere else. But I do, I have found a few places where there's knowledge that can be re reused. One is methods. Uh, I, I had a problem trying to study a group of professionals who were really, really busy. But in fact, people have studied translators who is who are also a professional group that is extremely busy and found ways to successfully study them and not be too intrusive on their work. So these kinds of things can be applied. There have been cognitive approaches that have are applicable. For example, eye tracking. I don't know which came first though. Some There were some early studies of lay users that involved eye tracking. Um, but another thing that area that is applicable is this getting away from just looking at the technology. Gaspari started that in, I think Lucas referred to one of his early surveys, but it's been taken up by others later. Like, so beyond the output of the MT, how are the tools? How usable are the tools for translators? Are there other technologies that could be put into these tools that would make life easier? And this has been taken up by, by researchers for of translators, for example, O'Brien, Maureen, who's on the the list here who's watching now. And I think this kind of this kind of approach to getting beyond just the technology can also be applied in studies of lay users. Um, I, I'd like to take this opportunity to open the, the chat to, um, I mean, the discussion to uh, the um, audience as well. Um, I, I unmuted or, or people can unmute, unmute themselves and join in the conversation. Um, I think what, what Mary, uh, what I was thinking following your comment is that maybe um, the, the uh, discourse that's been done on ethics of translation um, may change now, or at least uh, 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 correspond to this new, uh, um, new case where, where we're not dealing with a human translator uh, uh, or only with a human translator anymore. And, um, and also, like you said, the ethics and the responsibility for a non-translator user of machine translation is different um, than that of a translator. Uh, Lynn, you, you wanted to comment. Thank you. Yeah, um, uh, just to kind of keep the conversation going about uh, what, what's next and what needs to be and one thing that I'd like to kind of emphasize is that we could be socializing the idea, even with people who are not themselves big users of machine translation, in the sense that um, and writing is really important. And if we could socialize the idea with everyone that it's possible that people might be engaging with your text through machine translation. So if you want those people to understand your message, you should be approaching your writing, your text production in a translation friendly way. Even if you yourself don't plan to use machine translation, just realizing other people might be accessing your work through machine translation is something that I think we have a lot of work to do there. Uh, I'll say particularly among the Anglophone community, but not exclusively. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else want to join in? Uh, Maureen, perhaps? I, 
I see you on the chat, but. Okay, um, so um, if this, uh, this seems to be the, the uh, wrapping up stage. Um, so, I mean, I feel we could talk about this more. Um, okay, thank you, Maureen. Um, but um, our, prior, our time is pretty much up uh, anyway. Um, so I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, thank the speakers for sharing their insights, their knowledge. Um, I hope this is the beginning of more collaboration, um, joint projects uh, on this important and timely subject. Um, thank you to all the participants that joined us. Uh, we appreciate that you tuned in um, and I hope you found the presentations and discussion as fascinating, as useful as I did. Um, the plan is to upload uh, the recording of, of this um, symposium to our department's website or to the university uh, YouTube channel and send a link to, link to um, everyone who registered. So anyone who uh, missed some of the presentations uh, can have the opportunity to um, catch up. Uh, so that's it. Um, thank you once again for joining and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Amri, for organizing this event. As you said, I, I agree, it's the first of its type and it was time to do it. So good that you took the initiative. Thank you, Mary. Thank you all. Thank you all.